Starting us off in the A tier is the Jester. Jester, famously called Noob Bait, as I said by Moon Moon, which there's probably a thousand people like, huh? Best stress healer in the game, very cool party buff, very high base dodge, very low HP, and a very strong support class. So we can't talk about the Jester without first talking about Finale. I feel like that's the biggest dividing line between thoughts of Jester. It's also the biggest dividing line between builds of Jester. But yes, there are those instances where Finale buffed up, does ridiculous damage, and just completely crushes something and it's like, haha, you're supposed to be hard. But it's too much of an investment on average, and the situations where you want to use it, by the time you're going to use it, the fight is usually over or in hand, or you didn't really need it in the first place. So for instance, a lot of the abilities that the Jester has that aren't named Finale, buff Finale. They all buff it for a set amount of damage for 8 turns, so the devs are saying, you know, at best you can spend 8 turns setting this move up, and then you have to burn it, you only get one of them. So you spend 8 turns, buffing it up, making it super duper strong, and then you do your like 200 damage crit or whatever and hope it crits, and that's how you end the fight, right? It's in the name, Finale. The thing is though, you have to invest so much into it, the team has to accommodate for the Jester moving around all over the place. Because he can do it himself, but they have to be able to function as the Jester goes from like rank 4 or 3 up to 2 and 1. He also has to not die. And then you have to cash out on whatever target needs to be removed. The thing is though, most normal battles like hallway battles, room battles and stuff that aren't bosses, those fights are usually over by round 4? Round 4 or 5? Sometimes 3? So you don't really need to sit there and buff up the whole time. So in those cases, do you really need Finale? You could say that you do, I'm not saying that you don't, but instead of using Finale, you could spend the last two turns de-stressing people. That's also pretty good. You can open with it and hope it high rolls and takes out that squishy target that needs to go. Or you can use it to chunk down that boss on turn 8, which again is not bad, but also if you know what the boss is and you're properly prepared, usually your strategy is sustainable enough to where you don't need finale. Doesn't matter if you end it one or two turns sooner, if your strategy was unbeatable anyway or very hard to beat and the fight was in hand. If you're in a situation where you need a Hail Mary of finale because you have two people alive, something went wrong. It's not that finale was amazing, right? Something went wrong back in town. Something went wrong with your team choice. Sometimes the enemy just spammed a bunch of crits and high rolled you and that sucks. Or you could just chalk it up to my personal bias as you probably figured out after however long this video is at this point that I value consistency over high rolling so Finale being able to just absolutely dumpster stuff after a few turns, not bad, but I would rather use buffs, I'd rather use bleeds and stuff like that instead of using Finale to do a thousand damage, and then weaken my Jester for the rest of the fight if it didn't end the fight itself, which it ideally should be doing. And I feel like we could talk about Finale for 20 minutes, it could be its own video, but I'm not here to do that, but it does have to be addressed before we talk about the Jester. So otherwise, the Jester, pretty mobile, can get around, has stuff to do in every space, that's pretty good. Works pretty good on almost any team, very helpful with the Leper, so we like having our Jesters, we like hitting our stress heals, we like hitting Battle Ballad to do ridiculous crits, and also buffing crit rates on heals, so very helpful, supportive stuff from the Jester. As I said, between, of course, Finale and Solo and Dirk Stab, you can move around pretty easily with the Jester. Also has some pretty high base movement. And where things get kind of sticky is when you have Harvest and Slice Off. They are two moves that effectively almost do the same thing. They do bleed from the same ranks, hitting the same targets. One just hits two, and the other hits one. Where Slice Off hits one person for more, Harvest hits two people for less, but you're spreading out your damage, so it's the one irritation I have in the Jester design is you have two moves that are almost the same thing. I would rather just do one or the other and then I could pick up a, a fourth move, a different one. Having both of them at the same time feels bad because you're saying I'm going to bleed these two spots, but neither of them are bad individually. Does that make sense? They're bad together, but not bad individually. And so having something so similar in the Jester arsenal that almost do the same thing is not, it's not a good feeling. I don't like having to build around it. So usually just pick one or the other. My point is it kind of feels like the Jester has a wasted move. Instead of having something else it could have had, it has these two bleed moves that are very similar. But other than that, as we were saying, Battle Ballad, incredible buff, very helpful. It gives the leper everything it needs. It helps all your other characters. When you get to champion missions and accuracy starts becoming a real concern, instead of putting on your various like sun or moon rings or focus rings and stuff like that, you can just bring a jester and just hit Battle Ballad every turn. Like that takes up a trinket slot for everyone, basically, as one ability that you can use whenever the hell you want. It's really good. And since it's not a per battle buff and it's a per round thing, it can do, like we said, 
said with old Bolster, where you can battle ballad outside of a different fight and then carry the buff into a new one, so you can still abuse it that way. And then Inspiring Tune is just solid. You can always just hit that stress heal whenever you get a free round. Got nothing else to do. Sometimes you can stall a fight a little bit longer, hit Inspiring Tune once or twice. And the best part about it is not only the immediate strategical use of not having your character stressed out and afflictions and stuff like that, Inspiring Tune does save you money over the long term. So if you're thinking of it from the Blood Moon perspective of limited time, limited deaths, being able to save literally thousands of gold over time with Inspiring Tune. Very helpful, very cool ability. I know I said we weren't talking about Color of Madness that much, but there's a reason that the Jester shows up in quite a few of the high wave runs. You know, there's a reason the Jester, when you pair it with the Vestal, you just feel like you have your sustain covered. So it never feels bad to bring the Jester, even in spots where they don't bleed. You can just take off your bleed abilities, and if you want, you can go Finale, or you could go Dirk Stab, and you can just spam Battle Ballad and Inspiring Tune the whole time. It's still good. It's never bad. And that's what we were saying before about niches and stuff like that. There's Never really a bad situation for the Jester. There's never a time where you go and hit Inspiring Tune or Battle Ballot and you go, wow, that felt bad. It, that never happens. Camping skills are pretty cool. I like the all the song references. You have to share at the turn back time, but a lot of stress management. Tiger's Eye, very good. Even Mockery, pretty good. You can lower someone or everyone else's stress at the cost of someone else's, but then that's one. it's basically one Inspiring Tune away from fixing in the next battle. But otherwise, I feel that every rose has its thorn is probably the best camp skill for him. If you're going for the stress management, otherwise it's Tiger's Eye. But still, very good camp skills. His class trinkets are all pretty good. You got some bonus to bleeds, or you got some defensive stuff, or you got crits, you got stress management. So it's really, what am I doing with my Jester? Am I doing DPS? I have two or three choices for that. Am I doing support? I have a couple choices for that. He's pretty good with some neutral trinkets. I used to put the Ancestor's Code on him, which gave him the plus 15 dodge. You know, he didn't care about the minus 10 stress, so his base dodge was like 50, right? So you don't even need the Antiquarian spamming vapors or whatever. You just have your Jester at baseline 50 dodge, which is actually pretty solid. His Crimson Quartz set really supports his stress lowering and finale, because when it says position 1, it's saying you're gonna do finale. So it gives you some buffs to survive and go first up there, so you sit there and you do all your normal stuff, get your backline buffs going like Battle Ballad and Inspiring Tune and whatnot, and then you solo up to the front where you activate your bonus dodge and your bonus speed, and then you hit finale and then you're out of there. But again, I don't like finale, I don't think it's that good. So having a set that's almost dedicated to it, or at least one of the pieces is, doesn't feel too amazing. And in terms of the tasting cup, you can also just use one of the tambourines and get by almost as easily. His dirge is actually pretty good. You don't really need laudanum that much, and I mean that horror is not super common. It is nice to have something to get rid of it, but it's not incredibly common. But then having something that lowers stress is pretty good. Having an access to bonus damage is pretty good if you want to go that direction. All in all, Jester, pretty solid. Never feels bad taking one. You never tell yourself in the middle of the mission, you know, this is a waste of a character, I shouldn't have this here. A lot of his benefit isn't direct. You know, he's not hitting the fat crits like some of the other damage characters. He's not doing the 25 HP heal like the Occultus. He's just there gently lowering your stress, letting your characters go first with Battle Ballad, which does matter because if you go first or ahead of someone else and you kill them, that's one turn you're not taking their damage. Just little subtle things. His impact... It's kind of like a six man in basketball if you want to think about that like it's a six man that comes in and they always say that they may score like 15 points or something like that but the the benefit of that character is not directly reflected in the stat sheet it's kind of hard to track it there's no column where you go oh jester points these are all really good it's more of this just really good support that helps your team especially on the longer missions next up we're going with must love dogs the houndmaster houndmaster dps class has some flexibility in terms of support skills has the ability to guard other teammates, can do okay damage, has a good stun, has stress heal, has his own personal heal, which isn't as good when you're comparing it to things like the Leper and the Abomination who can heal themselves and their stress. Having an ability that just does HP heal doesn't feel that great. Baseline stats are pretty good, moderate speed, pretty good crit, pretty high dodge, considering it's this flex pick of a mid-range or a frontliner. Kind of low on the HP front, but it's okay. Pretty low on the damage, but it's got bleed on basically all of its attacks besides its stun. Doesn't usually need help in whatever team you put him in. He likes Mark. He can Mark himself, but he's one of those characters that you can just drop him in. He's just gonna do what he does. It's gonna be send the dog at people, hit those bleeds, sometimes hit a party skill, sometimes hit a stun. 
Doesn't really need anyone to set him up, doesn't really need anyone to help him, so he helps out everyone else. One of his most unique factors, which is sometimes his most annoying, is his dog treats. Or be R, grammatically correct, but the dog treats. Very good buff. Clog up your inventory. Usually, in a lot of cases, the dog treats are the first thing you throw away when you need to pick up extra loot. But then at the same time, you're always trying to hoard them for those tough fights. You get to the boss or the collector shows up or a shambler or some really hard room battle. Having the dog treats to buff your stats and your damage and your accuracy and all that is really good. But that's the thing, you usually have to hold on to them for a little bit so they end up clogging your inventory from those precious citrines. And the dog treats aren't like other curio. Other curio can get you loot. It can do things. It can do other helpful things. If you have holy water, that can lower your stress if you're in the ruins or something like that. Dog treats are just for a little damage boost to one character, and that's it. Like, they don't, I don't even think they sell back when you complete a mission. Houndmaster's another class I like taking to the Warrens because pretty much everything's a beast there. And bleed's very effective, so he does very well in that space, doing all that damage, all that bleed. Probably the best killer of the flesh boss, just because you can Hounds Harry all four pieces, get the bleed on, and just do absurd amounts of damage per turn but otherwise if it's not a beast or if it doesn't bleed houndmaster not doing too much especially this low base damage is 7 to 13 that might be the lowest outside of the antiquarian 7 to 13 is pretty low his mark is pretty good his high base speed lets him go before the arbalist so you can mark drop the prod on some of those big dudes can lower stress even though it's randomized it's still in your favor and it hits the whole party so it's really good guard dog buffs his dodge guards an ally pretty good. He doesn't care about protection. He's not taking hits. He doesn't want to get hit at all. And his self heal I feel is actually pretty bad. I still slot it sometimes just in case because you need an emergency heal from time to time but otherwise pretty bad. It's probably his worst skill I would say. And then there's Cudgel. Pretty high base stun. His weighted club or whatever adds a lot to it. So his stun, one of the best. Can hit three ranks so pretty good at controlling. So if you really want to you have your normal single target dog attack blackjack which i think i called cudgel a second ago then some other supportive stuff that you want usually a good loadout for him so the houndmaster brings a very specific damage set with a pretty good support set which makes him nice to have on a lot of teams doesn't need any help to get it done then we're gonna look at the camp skills has some of the best camp skills out there got your own nighttime ambush plus surprise thing which is really helpful even at four i would hit that every camp unless there's a highway man doing the same thing therapy dog really nice man's best friend really good Scouting chance, fantastic. Four points kind of hurts, but it's also bonus 30%. So if you're really trying to scout or surprise enemies or deal with stress, the Houndmaster's got it covered. When we get to the trinkets, we see a little bit of bias for the Bounty Hunter because the Agility Whistle is the same thing as the Bounty Hunter trinket that gives four dodge and one speed. They're both common quality, but, but for some reason, the Houndmaster has the minus 20 debuff. And it's just like, hey, Houndmaster probably a little better than the Bounty Hunter baseline, so you're gonna have to hold this debuff resist penalty. But otherwise, all the trinkets, pretty good. Situational, obviously. Build situational as well, but you can do something cheeky like the protective collar and then guard dog and stuff like that. You don't care about your damage at that point. You just have like 60% dodge or whatever. Spike color pretty good if you're trying to just squeeze out all the damage you can. Which actually got nerfed. I think the way the healing was done on it before was different. I don't think you have the minus 50% healing skills. Then his Crimson Court set, one of the best I would say. You don't really care about stun and debuff resist. Those just don't come up too often. Debuff does come up a lot, but stun, kind of whatever. But having bonus scout chance, 25%, you don't even need the set. I would just use the evidence by itself having that scout chance having that minus surprise chance for 10 percent stress on someone that's going to be doing killing anyway to get minus stress really good and then if you do get the set effect he sets himself up with the bleed chance or rather the bonus damage against bleed very very good set especially when compared to some of the other ones out there that aren't that good i'm looking at you vestal the Husfang Whistle, okay, as a trinket, it's really trying to tell you to guard an ally every single turn to keep use of that, that bonus duration and to offset the minus dodge already. Then the bonus bleed chance coming off the dog treats kind of feels bad because it already feels bad holding on to the treats longer than you want to. And then it's saying, hey, you get a bonus if you keep them, and it's like, yeah, but I don't want to. I just kind of want to use them for the big threat in the the mission and then just not worry about them and just weaken your trinket which kind of sucks otherwise the houndmaster feels good it's never bad it's kind of weird because i'm putting it in the a you probably make a case for like a high b but the baseline kit is pretty good his only real weakness is his low base damage being 7 to 13 otherwise brings a lot to the table a lot of scouting a lot of anti-surprise which is really good bleed which is 
I would say better than Blight as a damage type, and a good selection of trinkets makes them pretty flexible. Get to use whatever you want with them. And I always feel like I bring Houndmaster a lot to things just because it's solid, even though nothing it really does super Omega Wow impresses me. I hope the suspense and the tension are mounting as we get nearer to the end. You're probably like, I think it's this one gonna be at the top, or it might be this. You probably already know. Are you really good at guessing? Or you skipped ahead in the video and you came back? Either way, I'm gonna go with the next one, because we're not at the top yet. It's gonna be Hellion. A class that's like in the same vein as Houndmaster, where it never feels bad bringing it, and you can always make use of her, and she is fun, but she doesn't have that overwhelming presence, right? Like the Houndmaster is kind of the same way. The Houndmaster is just solid. He does everything he wants to do well. And there's one point I forgot about the Houndmaster that the beast archetype is also very common in the darkest dungeon, so that makes him a little better in there too. But the Hellion is this mix of kind of pretty good as a frontliner, has some controlling options with the double stun, does some pretty good damage, has really good reach. And I would actually say even though she's in the front, she has this weird mix. At 46 HP and 30 dodge, she has that bounty hunter highwayman kind of stat line there, but then she has 6 speed which is pretty garbage, so that's kind of like this midpoint around Crusader. A little faster than Crusader, but... So she's got DPS type of defenses, but then like tank type of speed, and then also Crusader level damage at 10 to 19, that's a little bit higher than Highwayman, who you haven't been able to figure out is probably our metric for melee DPS. But she puts out some pretty good damage, usually goes in the middle of the round instead of first, which kind of hurts, but then also does a lot of damage, and she has a lot of reach, can do some bleed, can just do some strong ass melee hits. And I said this in a video when I was talking about the Darkest Dungeon 2 trailer, I was talking about the Hellion. At 6 speed, it's kind of, uh, that's like her big drawback, and she should have a flaw. But I feel like if she was at 7 or 8 speed, if she was at 8 speed, she might be on like the cusp of S tier. But as such, at 6, that's really the only thing holding her back right now. If we look at her moves, she definitely likes being up front, usually slot 1, especially with her camp skill that we're going to see in a sec. But her pretty good base damage does a great job of smashing some of those frontliners. She can reach that middle rank with If It Bleeds. Iron Swan is one of those weird ones, because when you first start playing, at least this is how it was for me. You first start playing, it's just like, it's the same melee attack, but it hits the back person. You're thinking, why is that good? But actually, the reason it's good is because all the soft and squishy targets are back there. That hits those cultists, that hits the goblet bro, that hits the pink fish, that hits the stupid puking pig dude. So Iron Swan, pretty good at that. Usually, if it high rolls, can one-shot a lot of those. And with just like one damage trinket, she's pretty terrorizing against those backline, or that backline person. Really helpful against the Prophet. That's another character where she can just sit there and melee him in the back for free, which is really nice. Her double stun is really good. It's up there with... The Plague Doctor, the Plague Doctor is the only person that can also stun two people at once. So, a really fun team that you could run is having the Plague Doctor and then the Hellion. They could have like Quick Draw or something. You can just stun the whole team on turn one and then just take your pickings. If it bleeds, pretty standard as a bleed, pretty good. Breakthrough, more of a movement skill than anything else. You don't want to do this for damage. And that's her other big weakness is she doesn't have really good movement. Her base movement is just one space forward. She can't move back. She can only go forward and it's only one at a time, which if positioning happens, it kind of screws her or whoever else because she can't get up quickly. So if you're expecting that, use Breakthrough, at least do some damage on your way up there. And that all ties into her kind of gimmick mechanic of using her strong skills. Well, I say strong with air quotes because Breakthrough is not a strong skill, it's just a movement skill. But you use her Yop, you know, her Yell and her Bleed Out. And then you can use Adrenaline Rush to buff it back up so it's not, you know, as crippling. But usually you don't need it. You can just get by with her Wicked Hack or whatever, and then Iron Swan, and then if it bleeds. You almost don't need anything else with her at that point. And the fourth slot is just kind of up to you. I usually take the double stun because it's just good. It's good to have a double stun. Her camp skills are kind of bad. Her best one is probably Battle Trance, where she gets bonus damage in the front. That's just good. So you want to keep her up front the whole time doing that damage, making use of that. And it compounds with Iron Swan, right? So you can have Battle Trance and you just start one shot and chunking those rank four people on the enemy team. Revel is something I never have used. I have never used Revel in my life. Even at three, with the fat minus stress, the minus five accuracy is kind of whatever, the minus two speed is painful. I know it's supposed to simulate a hangover. I don't need minus stress that bad to take that fat of a penalty of the minus two speed. Turn order and action economy are is the key 
is the biggest factor of winning and losing fights. So going last or going way behind other people consistently is just not helpful to the victory strategy. Reject the gods pretty good if you don't have a religious party. So if you do, you want some kind of way to de-stress, so like a crusader or a jester or something like that. But otherwise pretty solid, only two points. Really good for a minus 30. And then there's sharpened spear, which is 10 crit for three points. And I think it was the bounty hunter that had bonus crit, but also bonus accuracy for three points. So sharpened spear feels not great. Plus 10 is a lot. At three points, kind of do that that wince. Just, you know, you don't want to really hard commit to that. But, I mean, you can get her crit chance up into the 30s baseline, which is pretty good. So you have all the tools to do just this hyper carry Hellion if you want to go the full damage route. You can just put her in slot one, give her trance, give her sharpened spear, and then just go to town on people. That is definitely a solid way to play her. Her trinkets are okay, but pretty meh at the same time. And honestly, when I was about to scroll down to the trinket list, I I always forget what trinkets she has besides the Heaven and Hell hairpins. I cannot remember the other three for the life of me, and it's just because they're so forgettable. And they're not terrible, right? 15 bleed chance is pretty good, especially for a common. Minus 15 stress, pretty good. There's no condition besides where you get it. The 15% HP, not bad. Minus stun, not a big deal. Heaven's hairpin, I always... Feel like I'm using this so the moment I get it I always feel like I that's just on her that's the almost attacks right but it, it's not necessary it's just it feels that strong in a lot of cases the 10 accuracy pretty good especially in the later missions when accuracy is an issue the minus 25 stress big deal very big deal and all of it's at highlight which highlight levels you're usually at those anyway I believe the Crimson Court is always considered highlight, so if you take her there, that's just fantastic. The Hell's Hairpin, I haven't done too many dark runs. I'm gonna do a dark playthrough. I'm gonna do a Torchless playthrough at some point, I want to. But out of the few dark runs I've done, uh, Hell's Hairpin, pretty good. The minus debuff, minus bleed, not a big deal. The 10 crit, huge. 15 accuracy, pretty good, because all of the dodge chances for the monsters goes up when it gets darker. So if you're going to do dark mode runs, Hellion, pretty good to take, especially with that thing. And since crit chances are going up and her crit's already pretty solid, you buff it a little bit and then you have that hairpin. She's sitting at like 50 crit, which is fantastic. You can just start blowing people up. The Crimson Court set is another, I keep using the term, the high rolly kind of thing, where she has to be low HP and not dying, and then you just get a bunch of buffs, ridiculous damage increase. Like, that's huge. Just being under 25% HP with a war paint for damage at max would be like 16 to 27-ish around there. That's that's massive, that's past the leper. The 10 stress, whatever. And then it covers all the other bases. She gets a little extra dodge, a little extra accuracy, bleed chance, death blow, speed. I think I said speed twice. Healing received, 15%, not game breaking. So it's a, it's a solid set, you just have to play dangerous with her HP total, which I could see sitting under 50% pretty consistently. Sitting under 25, I'd be a little nervous. So if you kind of want that razor's edge with her and maybe the flagellant or something like that, you definitely have the tools to do it. Thirsting Blade, kind of scary, because you take some self-harm, and then your bleed resist is also lower, so there's a very real scenario where you could self-harm yourself down to low HP and then a bleed could actually threaten you. That's kind of scary. But otherwise you get big speed, because I said before, she needs speed, right? So you get some extra speed, the plus two, and then you get some extra crit against bleeding. I wouldn't use it to set herself up. It would be more if I used a Houndmaster or some other bleed class or a Flagellant. Starting to see a lot of synergy between them. I don't think the attack miss thing is going to be a big deal with the plus 15 unconditional accuracy. So it's a pretty good DPS weapon, and if you really wanted to potentially min-max, you could actually use like the Thirsting Blade with the Linus War Paint and kind of self-harm your way down to low HP potentially, but it's pretty inconsistent, but that's just, it's there. It's like a little synergy I just spotted. Otherwise, your trinket's pretty solid for the most part, even if a couple of them are forgettable. So the Hellion occupies the spot of a solid frontliner because she can stun the other frontliners so she's not as threatened by them. Then she can pick off people in the back which is pretty nice. She has bleed, she has uh, versatility in her range. As I was saying before, how accommodating does the team have to be for her? Not very, they just have to let her sit up front which is basically what the leper's doing. And you might be saying, well if that's like the same weakness they share, why isn't she lower the leper higher? And I would say that the leper just hits rank one and two. That's all the leper's doing. It's physical damage to those two all the time besides the occasional purge. The Hellion can pick off backliners, can stun, can bleed. Her base damage is really good. So the Hellion has a lot more flexibility, even if they share the same weakness. So that's why I put her a lot higher than the leper. 
Up next is my favorite class thematically, as the Plague Doctor. I like the class for the the aesthetic and stuff like that. I really like the alchemy and the the plague and the sickness and the you know the doctor's mask and all that. So I think she's really cool. I dig the playstyle with the poisons and the stuns, which got nerfed a little bit. She got some support skills. She has a little bit of flexibility with incision, which is still not that good, but still a solid class. Works pretty well in a lot of places. Has a different couple build options. Very self-sufficient. She can't like spam self-heal or whatever lower her own stress, right? It's not leper level. You just put her on the team, she's gonna throw stuns, she's gonna throw buffs, she's gonna throw poison. She doesn't need anyone else to help her. She doesn't need much to get going. She doesn't have to be high level. She doesn't need a certain trinket. It's very solid. And then we're gonna get into the specifics before I spend the whole time just gushing about this character. First thing we can note is her massive speed stat at nine. Pretty common to be up there almost going first or potentially going first with those backliners. So something that's really helpful to do. You run into those fights, there's like a cultist or a pink fish, or sometimes a madman, sometimes you get to be lucky and go first, or if you get quick draw, which is incredible, quick draw and on guard on your plague doctor, I feel like are auto lock-ins. Yeah, you go first, you hit that double stun, you hit that double poison, start wearing them down, hit that double stun again, she can almost solo a backline herself in like three turns. And though she got nerfed and some of the other stuff that we'll talk about in a minute, she actually got some buffs as well, which is surprising. The first one being Noxious Blast, which is her normal single target grenade that hits people in the front. It did not use to lower accuracy, and it did one less blight per rank, I believe. Like, per threshold. So it used to be 456, not 567. I actually don't know why they gave her that. I also don't know why they gave it minus accuracy. It's small, but it's still helpful, right? That move was still good without it. That's definitely a plus one point for her. She got something helpful, even though she got stuff taken away. Play grenade is what you're gonna be commonly throwing into the back. That's part of the combo to solo back lines that I was talking about with blinding gas. You just throw a play grenade and then rotate with blinding gas. Sometimes you just need two play grenades and the eventual dot stack and the turn skipping from the stun is enough to kill both of them, especially if they're lower HP like the Goblets and the Cultists. Very handy skill, never not bad even if it hits like one person, still solid. Then there's Blinding Gas which got nerfed because stalling and stun comps were a little too strong. So Blinding Gas became three uses per battle instead of Endless. This was more to balance the Color of Madness than anything else because it wasn't so much an issue in the base game, but Red Hook I'm sure was undoubtedly fearful of uh, going into the Endless Harvest with a Plague Doctor that literally keeps the backline locked down every other turn. So you can see how that's broken. But even at three uses, it's still good. That's enough to get you through almost any normal battle. Any short non-boss battle is gonna be three to five rounds anyway, usually about four, so you don't need three shots of it. Usually on the boss battles, you don't need more than three. By the time you're out of it, you have other stuff you're doing, like spamming Noxious Blast or Plague Grenade or whatever, or using the disorienting one, the single target stun. So again, having three shots, not that detrimental, even though it is a nerf. Incision, pretty bad unless you have the trinket specifically designed for it. What's really nice about it is that you can use it from rank three, because if you had to be frontline plague doctor with it, that would be kind of, eh, not that good. So if you're going to go incision, definitely go rank three and then use some combination of buffs alongside it. Battlefield medicine, not super good for the flat HP that it heals. It only goes up to three, which is not great. But what makes it really good is that you cure yourself and the other person, so those shamblers or any other monster that can throw a damage over time on the whole party or multiple people, being able to cure two at a time is great. That saves bandages and anti-venoms, so if you're going up against that, definitely slot it. And even though it heals for a small flat amount, you have to think of it like the other way. You know, if the Blight is doing two damage a tick and you heal it on yourself and the other person, yeah, you heal like two damage from the skill itself, but then removing that blight or whatever from both people, you just healed, I don't know, around 10 damage, something like that, retroactively, not retroactively, proactively, which is really good. So don't sleep on battlefield medicine, even though the initial benefit of just going, oh, I got plus two life, that's not great. Look at it kind of from the, the long-term perspective. Emboldening vapors, two uses per battle, still a really good damage buff. You get the plus speed, so if you just want your hyper carry to just start wrecking people, you just start hitting them with this, or you can put it on two different people. Go first, 
Crush the competition, Seize Glory, and then Disorienting Blast. Really good skill. I would actually say it's one of her best up there with Blinding Gas because being able to target the second rank and back is really good for a stun. She can use it from everywhere except slot one. Very good. And Clearing Corpses. Sometimes it doesn't even matter if you can actually stun the person. Just the fact that you can one-shot a corpse, especially like those giant corpses where they take up two spots and they have 40 hit points or whatever. Being able to clear those with one shot, very helpful. As I said before, I don't think anyone else besides the leper has an ability to get rid of corpses so being able to do that very helpful disorienting blast very good skill and it's even unlimited uses per battle so suck at blinding gas camp skills the best one is leeches I think that used to be two I think they put it to three I don't remember it being three I think it used to be two maybe I'm wrong but being able to remove a disease and a little bit of healing very good stuff a lot of the times it's worth taking a plague doctor on a mission just to camp her and use leeches to remove some random disease especially if they have two or whatever just because that saves you gold you're trading a camp skill you know three points for a camp skill for a few hundred gold which is really nice diseases aren't super common but there's some really nasty ones that when they hit you go i hate life you know like the red plague and syphilis and all that crap the experimental vapors with the healing okay for the flat 50 at four points kind of steep like the flat 50 is good if you're in that situation where you just i need a heal Right, I went on a medium mission where I had a crusader and a plague doctor, but no other actual healer. I was just relying on that, using it's pretty good. I like it more for the bonus healing received. That could be really good if you have like a man at arms that you're trying to keep alive and you're gonna be doing a lot of guarding. It's really good, or if you're just worried about someone taking a lot of damage, you just have something that brings them back. The cure, removing your own disease, pretty good. The disease resists whatever for the most part. Like I said, diseases aren't super common outside of that spitting pig in the warrens. And usually if you're removing a disease, it's not too common to get another one in the same dungeon. And at one point, still not a waste by any means. Definitely helpful to use, even proactively. Sometimes you use 11 points, there's one left over, and it's just like, why not use the cure? Why not get that disease resist? And then self-medicate, I'm trying to figure out why this exists. Minus 10 stress, okay. I'd rather have minus 10% stress for a three point skill. Heal 20 HP, not bad. Remove bleeding blight. She can already do that herself. So why do you need a camp skill for it? Plus 10 accuracy. Accuracy is actually not her problem. She actually never has a problem with accuracy, especially if you use like Blasphemous Vial. Even then, her base accuracy is pretty good, so her grenades and stuff aren't usually missing. And then if you're going incision, you have the herb, the bloody herb or whatever, to boost your accuracy, so you don't really need that. For what you get out of it, it's not bad, but you just don't need it. I don't know, I never... I don't think I've ever used this in my 500 hours of Darkest Dungeon. I don't think I've ever hit self-medicate. Maybe once. That's it. In terms of trinkets, it's not so much that the Plague Doctor has good trinkets, it's that she has a couple really good trinkets that you're always going to be putting on, depending on whatever build you're running. So the Diseased Herb, no one cares about. The Rock Cut Sensor, no one cares about. Witch's Vile, very good early game. Poisoned Herb, pretty good if you need to really overcome those Blight Resists, even on some of those that get up to like 100. Sometimes just having that extra 40, not bad. Minus 15% HP kind of hurts. And I'm not talking about literally, I'm talking about figuratively. I'd rather it be like minus 10, but you get plus 40. That's high. That's a lot for an uncommon. So it's still good if you need that extra blight insurance. Bloody herb, if you're going incision, you need that. It's too efficient for its rarity and its stats. Actually, it used to be green. I'm pretty sure it used to be an uncommon trinket. And then it got buffed to rare. But 10 accuracy, pretty good. 30 bleed chance, fantastic. 20 damage, fantastic. So if you're going incision, you need that and probably something else to really drive it home. But uh, that's like a one-stop trinket. So you're going to be putting that on and then anything else is just like icing on the cake to really supplement the build. And then there's Blasphemous Vial. It's been nerfed and I want to say it's been nerfed twice, but at least once. This thing was insane in like vanilla Darkest Dungeon before Crimson Court. Uh, it used to have higher, I want to say Blight and less stress. I think the stress was plus 20 and I think the Blight chance was 40 before and the accuracy might have been 15. It was something along those lines. It was just disgusting how good this thing was. It's still great. It's still her best trinket because it accommodates the most of her play styles. So in a lot of cases you just want to get this early. I mean if your first boss kill like you know your level one necromancer kill if you can get this your plague doctor is set for like the entire playthrough. It's so good. There are very few trinkets where I go I need to actively go out of my way and potentially risk a run or risk a party to get this trinket, and Blasphemous Vial is definitely one of those. I can't remember if her Crimson Court set actually changed, but it's better than I remember it being. So bonus HP, pretty good, disease resist, who cares? 
I mean, it's still there. It's still help helpful. Uh, bleed skill. So it's telling you you have to go incision. And so what ends up happening with this is actually, the more I think about it, I would use the bloody herb and then I would use the dissection kit. That would probably be my two combo trinket setup if I wanted to go incision. The only thing that I don't like is you can argue it's versatility, but I think it's that thing like the uh, the mirror shield, right? Where it kind of clashes with itself. So if you're looking, you get all this these bonuses. Okay, bonus HP. That's good wherever, but usually better near the front where incision is being used. Bonus damage does not help your blights in any way, so that helps incision. Bonus bleed helps incision. Bonus blight chance. I'm not blighting, I'm incisioning, right? If I'm going in there trying to hit bleeds, I'm not trying to hit blights. Bonus stun skill, pretty good. 15 is still solid, so the only really wasted stat on there is the blight chance, but you don't get any bonus accuracy either, so you gotta hope that your base accuracy is good enough. Incision, I think, is 85, which is not amazing, but there's still a lot of good stuff going on here, so if you have some way to circumvent it or whatever, again, this is another set that I still feel benefits the incision build, but you already have something that benefits the incision build. It's called the Bloody Herb, and it's not a trinket set. You still get the flexibility. So I don't think the Crimson Quartz set is that good. Like, it looks good, and it's okay, but it's not conducive to what I feel her best setup is. The Ashen Distillation, actually pretty good. Bonus Dodge, never bad. Bonus Blight, never bad. So you could use this in a Blasphemous Vial. It's actually pretty good. Like, that covers all bases. That's such a great setup. The more I think about it, just get this bonus healing received, potentially. Bonus Blight, hit all the Blights. Bonus Dodge, really good. Her base dodge is okay. And overall, the Plague Doctor, still a very solid character. I would say contender for one of the better ones, definitely. And that's kind of flip-floppy, isn't it? Contender for potentially one of the okay above half ones? No, she's, she's good. She's definitely good. She's not usable everywhere. That's kind of her drawback and we gotta keep remembering our criteria and I forgot to kind of reinforce it a little bit but her her bleed is okay so the flexibility is there but it's not the best I would rather use a different bleed character than her her buffs are good her trinkets are good her blight stun archetype is fantastic wherever that works it is so good to the point where I'm not sure why you'd want to use anything else but the options are there which is why she is solidly A tier despite the nerfs. Oh, I forgot to mention this. So before I was always teasing about like the three top characters, this was the other one. Back when you could use blinding gas unlimitedly. Is that a word? That's a word now. Shakespeare made words, I too make words. But back when some of the other characters were not buffed and the Plague Doctor was a little more ridiculous with her unlimited stunning and her unlimited emboldening vapors or whatever to give damage and speed, I said she was an S tier character. I definitely felt she was. Special in Blasphemous Vial was still absurd, not nerfed. You could even take her into places like the wheel and consistently hit blades with no problem. So maybe, maybe you've noticed, maybe you're really up on your darkest dungeon, but the Plague Doctor's had a lot of various nerfs. She's had items nerf, she's had abilities nerf, she's had system mechanics nerf, like her blinding gas being three things or three uses now. So there's a reason they had to keep hitting her, right? It's because she was just that good before. Alright, coming up next, it's starting to get a little contested as we go forward, and I was thinking about it too. I didn't want to actually rate the Arbalist, but, or not the Arbalist, the Musketeer, but she would be down here for the sole reason that she clogs up your trinket potential and your hero carriage with another character because she has her own items. So it's not like she replaces the Arbalest, she just exists alongside the Arbalest. And so having to split all of your stuff, your potential drops and heroes that you get between two characters that do the same thing, Kinda sucks, which is why she's down here in the C tier. Otherwise, going forward, it's starting to get really contested. Near the top, right, you can kinda see, maybe you can figure out where we're going by the end of it. I think after the next couple, it's gonna be pretty obvious, but we're gonna go with the Occultist next. The reason being, he's got this, he's pretty versatile. I think that's one of the, that is the criteria that nets him the most imaginary fake points is the fact that he can do so many things. He has a specialized damage type, which is incredibly helpful. Eldritch is the most common enemy type at the end of the game, which makes a lot of forays, forays? For, for expeditions into the darkest dungeon. It's usually helpful to have an occultist on there. When I beat the game the first time, I think I brought an occultist to all four missions. Statistically, one of the lowest HP counts, it's, I think, bottom three. It's around there with Grave Robber, and both of those are higher than Antiquarian. Okay, dodge at 30. Pretty good speed at eight. And then, uh... His damage is pretty low, all things considered, because he's more of a supportive thing. His damage is secondary, it's more all the other stuff you get to do with him. And thankfully, his crit buff bonus is focused on his healing, 
That's because it's probably assumed that all occultist builds are gonna run the heal because you can use it in all four ranks. So it's always good to just slot in there for emergencies, even if he's not a primary healer in the team, but he can still do it, right? He can still be your solo healer. So for the moves, Sacrificial Stab's actually pretty good. Does some okay damage. His damage isn't high baseline, as you saw, it was seven to 13 at max. So the plus 15% doesn't scale too hard for him, but the massive crit modifier on it makes uh, Sack Stab a really good move. And it can hit the third rank. It's one of the few melees that they didn't gimp to only focus on the front two. Abyssal Artillery is good. Usually the backline's weaker. And it has this weird tug of war going on where you have the minus 33% damage, but then like the plus 15 against Eldritch. And I don't remember if it always had the 33% minus, it might have. But either way, this move is kind of underwhelming. As time goes on, I find myself using it less and less. But it can still be viable if you stack a bunch of damage on him and just use him as a, a literal spellcaster and just bomb uh, the artillery and your random curses and debuffs. Speaking of, weakening curse, really good. I believe it got nerfed. It used to be 33% minus damage and went down to 20 and that way you used to be able to against like the prophet an old strat that's still pretty good is that you can just spam weakening curse on him to lower the uh the rubble that falls on your party so it's not as damaging but minus prot very helpful and it subtly has a really strong crit modifier so you just you'll hit those like two damage crits as you're using it which is pretty funny but it's one of the few skills that can lower damage outright so that makes it really good so debuff occultist very viable strategy if you want to go that way Next up is his heal, which it's kind of like the Jester where you have to talk about Finale before you do anything else. Uh, for the Occultist, you have to talk about the heal before you really get into anything else. And the reason is the heal is one of those things where sometimes it crits for 36 or whatever and you just go, this class is amazing. And there are a lot of times where it just does zero or two or whatever, right? At max rank, its average heal is about 11, but you're not always getting 11. And for every huge super crit that takes someone from zero to full from death's door, you gotta keep in mind that you probably rolled a couple like twos and fives and zeros along the way. And had it been consistently doing like 11 or whatever, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, a bonus healing trinket is very helpful to get around this because you can get his base healing cap up to like 26, 28, that kind of stuff, so that's really good. But otherwise, the extreme variance in this move makes it unreliable a lot of the times. Instead of having plus 25% healing bonus, I would rather have like a trinket that boosts it the minimum healing. I'd rather the minimum be like three or something. If I had a trinket that gave it plus three to the minimum, so it was three to 22 or whatever, I would actually like it a lot more. I would think that'd be a good improvement. But that is part of the character, right? He's tapping into the occult, and the occult can be very random and uncertain, so it actually makes sense that this weird, literally weird, way of healing people and stitching them back together or whatever is pretty variable. The Hex is pretty good. I don't like marks that decrease dodge. It's still good, but usually, I guess there's a playstyle preference, but usually I'm accounting for accuracy, so I usually put accuracy trinkets on. But either way, I think that Lowering prot is much more important, but he does have a way to do that with the weakening curse. So if you really wanted to, you could mark and then weakening curse and just nerf all their damage. So he has some pretty good synergy with himself. You can just rotate debuffs, right? Give him a debuff trinket, really good. But either way, he has a mark that he can use anywhere. That's really good. Does actual uh, a small amount of damage, so it can actually finish people off at one and two HP, which is pretty cool. And as I said before, just the sheer versatility of the character definitely helps uh, his overall ranking. Hands of the Abyss, I feel like I've used it the least, just because he has to be on the front line to make use of it. So in most cases, you want to have some kind of defensive trinket. Maybe the I forget which box it's called. I think the Overture box from the Madman that gives a boost of damage and dodge, or not uh, damage, hit points. That gives a boost of hit points and dodge but usually when you have a stun you probably want a stun trinket on top of that so you really have to be careful with your second trinket selection at that point his inline base dodge is pretty good you just have to keep in mind that you have a pretty squishy spellcaster up front that's gonna be taking a lot of hits i don't like the minus torch that this gives but it is thematic for him and either way it's still a pretty good ability if he could use it in the third rank it'd be broken so i do agree that it's first two only and it makes it so if you want to do something like sacrificial stab weird reconstruction and then Hands from the Abyss, you're pretty flexible on your last spot because you already cover a lot of stuff. You have a damage, a heal, and then a stun, so you can just do whatever you want with the last one. The last ability, the Daemon's Pull, I think I forgot about this when I was talking about Corpse Clearing, so I think this is the third skill that can do it, along with the Plague Doctor and the Leper. But this is really good, and it's not even so much just the pull. The pull is good, right? Being able to pull someone up from the back is very helpful. It does okay damage, even at the minus 50%. Like, he slips in damage in places, and he has a lot of crit mods on his abilities. So the Occultist does supplement a lot of his support abilities with the ability to add a little bit of damage, you know, like three to five 
hereabouts, which is, it adds up, it's very helpful, right? And clearing corpses is almost worth it by itself. So again, the name of the game with the occultist is versatility. So if you want to go debuffs and stuns, you got that. If you want to go damage, you got that. If you want to go positioning, right? Shuffling the party around, you got that. So it's really whatever you make of it. And his trinkets do a pretty good job of helping him achieve these ends. His camp skills are some of the strangest, but again, occultist, right? That's supposed to be strange, but they're very tough to use. I feel like, for instance, lowering your own stress is okay. The minus 25, not huge, but it is one cost. And then you put some random stress on the rest of the team. It's good and bad. So you really have to weigh if it's worth using at that point. Removing a mortality debuff with Dark Ritual, actually pretty good if you need it. It's one of those things where you almost never need it, but when you get to use it, you go, okay, this is fantastic. So reducing Torchlight by 100 isn't too big of a deal. Giving yourself stress, not very helpful, but you also get a fat heal on top of it. So if you scrape out of a battle and someone almost died and they're at like zero hit points, death door kind of thing, you can just heal them up, remove mortality. I think there's only one or two other moves that get rid of this as well. Dark Strength, arguably his best move, his best camping thing. Just because 15 stress is a low penalty for plus 20% damage at two points, that's actually really good. So if you ever want to just hyper carry on someone, you can just drop them 20% extra damage, just have them train wreck people. And then the Commune is the only nighttime ambush preventer that costs three points. I think all the rest of them cost four, but then you give yourself, or you give all your companions a little bit of extra stress, so still not bad. I'd rather use Bandit Sense or the uh, the guard dog or whatever it is, watchdog, the one that gives the same thing as bandit sense. But again, if you have some other thing, like you want to use zealous speech at five points, right? Having an extra three, just never bad. Or I should say having one that prevents ambush at three is pretty helpful, especially if you don't have anyone else that can do it. Surprisingly, all of his base trinkets are actually pretty good. And even more surprising, I think his common ones are the two best that he has access to. The Eldritch Killing Incense is fantastic. Even though it focuses on one type of enemy, it's pretty strong against that type of enemy, and the bonus crit is probably the biggest factor about it. The Evasion Incense, I don't think it had the minus speed before, so I think that was a nerf. I remember I used to use this pretty much all the time. It'd be like, whatever trinket I'm trying to use to supplement his build, like a Sun Ring or Healing Booster, and then it would just be Evasion Incense. And it's still good. Usually the trade-off is about 4 dodge to 1 speed, so having 8 dodge to 1 speed, you still, you come out ahead. Overall, it's kind of like cheating the the normal trade-offs and formulas that they've established. Cursed Incense, not too big of a deal. You lose the 10 HP, but he's usually at the back, and that equates to about 3 hit points for him, 3 or 4, I can't remember which. But having plus 40% debuff, very helpful. Move skill chance, very helpful. If you really wanted to, I would probably use a debuff amulet instead, whichever one that's called, that give, it's the green one that gives plus like 30% debuff chance. So arguably on par with that, but if you want to boost your pulling ability, use this instead. Sacrificial Cauldron, very good, just flat 20% damage. 10% stress is kind of whatever, you can deal with it even though it stresses himself out, you just have to have that in the back of your head, the stress always going to be coming up with him, but flat 20% damage, pretty good. Even though he's not primarily a damage dealer, it is a big boost. The Demon's Cauldron is probably the one I've used the least, and that's just because it has two huge negatives. I would actually say this is worse Trinket. The three crit's pretty nice, but having the combination of minus Virtue Chance with plus stress is pretty bad, because he's going to hit the wall a lot sooner, but then also you just basically eviscerate your potential virtue chance with the same thing, so I tend to avoid it. I'd rather use anything else almost, in most cases, which is surprising. Usually the very rare trinkets, you want those to be good in this one. It is, it's good, the numbers are good, but it's definitely a pro and con thing, and I'm not in favor of those cons. This Crimson Court set is actually really good. It just kind of buffs everything that he's about at the cost of 10% HP, basically. The minus bleed skill chance applies to his heal, so you have less chance to bleed your teammates when you're healing them. I think the minus 25 makes it almost non-existent that you can bleed them. I think it puts it down into like the 30s, the bleed chance. So unless there's like a minimum 5% chance, I don't think you're going to bleed anyone reliably. In exchange for that 10 HP, 10% HP, you get a fat speed boost, fat damage boost, huge dodge, a bunch of bonus percentages on every other move that you have access to if you decide to play it about half light or lower. So overall, solid set, not the best one, but definitely, definitely like top 15. The Petrified Skull is cheap for a reason, it's not that good. It's one of those things where if you bring it to where it's supposed to be, aka the Farmstead, or if you're fighting Eldritch, then it's pretty good. I was talking before about having him as a frontline build with the stun. 
you could reliably go into the cove with the petrified skull, and then maybe like the cursed incense or something, and then he would be fine up there. He's gonna be taking 30% prot, you can have a bonus 5% HP as a net, and you have huge stun chance and all that, so that would be a good combo to run. But by itself, it's not that good, but again, it is 25 shards, that's not super expensive by any means. Overall, the Occultist is pretty good if you're trying to kill Eldritch. He has some really interesting attacks that cover a plethora of ranges. He has some okay damage output since all of his stuff still causes damage. He doesn't have anything that's just like minus 100%. And then his versatility is the strongest suit by far. You can have a healer with a big support loadout or you could have someone that has a heal in case of emergency and he's focused on damage. And if you do go the damage route, I would say go Sacrificial Stab over Artillery. I don't think Artillery is that good, even if you can make use of it consistently. The minus 33% damage just sucks too much. But it does target two things, that's definitely worth something. By now you're probably asking yourself, how small is S tier? You're starting to run out of heroes. Well, we're gonna go with the Vessel next. I think the remaining four heroes, each one of them could have easily been in the S tier. And the reason the Vestal actually misses it is largely because of her not too great camping skills that require a party, right? She's very supportive, but if you aren't rolling with two or three religious people with some of her camp skills and all that, it's usually not as good as other skills, which kind of sucks. Let's talk about the pros. She's the best healer in the game, and the reason is because she's consistent. She has the only group heal. Her single target healing is really good. I feel like Judgment's an underrated skill. She has a couple debuffs, and she's pretty tanky, all things considered. So 44 HP, pretty good, as I said before, really tanky. Or considerably tanky, especially for a backliner. Six speed, middle of the pack, that's up there with your Hellions and all that, so... Respectable, not great, but okay. I'm sure there are people out there that are thinking, well, I want her to go last because she's healing, right? And that's kind of a... It's a little bit of a logic trap, because in a game like this, you don't want to be playing reactively if you can help it, you want to be playing proactively. I'd rather have her go first, and then if I need to heal turn two, I'll do that, instead of just waiting to heal. Does that make sense? But also, her damage is okay It's 7 to 14. That's backline damage, and we're going to talk more about her builds and all that, but I think for rank 3 or 4, specifically 3, I think she's just really good there, and it's never bad having her. I always feel like any team that I make, if I take a Vestal with me, I just feel infinitely safer. It just feels consistent, it always feels like I have reliable healing, and it feels like the only time I'll lose someone is to something like an Affliction, or someone gets snowballed really hard and like double crit into a bleed or she gets stunned right when she needs to heal someone. Like, that's the kind of stuff that gets people killed with a Vessel around. Unless you just straight up misplay, but if she can just consistently drop heals every turn, it's pretty hard to actually die with her in the party. So here's where the Vestal loses points. It's the fact that her melee build with Mace Bash and all that is actually not that good. It works, but it's like a worse Crusader. We talked a second ago about traps such as having her go last every time. The other trap I do feel is the melee build, because you look, her Mace Bash doesn't even have a crit modifier or damage modifier, it's just, you know, flat whatever you get. Unholy is one of the least common enemy types, and considering she has 7 to 14 damage instead of like the normal melee 8 to 16 or 9 to 16, or even the Crusaders 10 to 19, makes having her up front not great. The only benefit of the rank 2 Vestal, I feel, isn't so much her damage, because it's not really there. You can boost and all that, but it's not about that. It's she gets a couple debuffs, she gets her stun, and she can use her group heal from rank two. That's what actually makes it really good. You have a group healer in rank two, which means you can use her to supplement your occultists if they're your primary healer. So it's this weird backwards way of doing things. I'd rather have the occultist the one doing damage in that situation, but if you want it to go that way, you could do it. And like I said, she's actually pretty tanky. She's more tanky than someone like the Highwayman, I believe, and the Bounty Hunter, she's up there with them, so she can hang, she just doesn't have the damage output as those characters do. I said before, Judgment's underrated, I feel like, just for the fact that it heals her, so there'll be a lot of times where she gets hit by something, she's missing 5 HP, and you could use Divine Grace and heal her back up yourself, or you could just hit Judgment. You don't even have to hit a person, you just hit a corpse. It's pretty good, and it's got a crit modifier also, like the plus 5, so you can boost your healing skills after, but there's a lot of times where, even with the minus 25% damage, she can put out some okay damage dropping the random judgments on targets she can consistently hit not those quick and evasive backliners but those like rank twos you know sometimes those rank threes those archers and stuff she's pretty good at hitting those so she can take care of herself with just judgment spam her stun's really good the fact that it boosts torch is also helpful that could actually save you some money i've done runs before for fun where i don't take any torches but it's not like a lightless 
type of run, it's usually the Vestal and something like the Crusader, and the Crusader uses the Bulwark of Faith or whatever to boost the light meter by like 20, and then she just spams stun every turn. You just have to hit one or two. Actually, if you look at it, the plus six counts for basically a tile, like a hallway tile. So as long as you hit one every fight, you almost don't need torches. And it's actually because Dazzling Light is, I feel like, a really good skill that I stopped using Sacred Scroll on her because it lowered her chance, but we'll talk about the trinkets in a minute. Divine Grace, really good. Can't even, don't have anything else to say about it. Just solid heal, best heal. Just consistently throw it out, give her a healing buff trinket, start hitting like those 12s to 14 or whatever. Pretty hard to kill someone outside of chain critting them to death. Divine Comfort, really bad at low levels, really good at high levels when you can get some healing trinkets and also it heals like three to five or whatever the max rank is. Hand of Light is kind of what she's balanced around in terms of DPS. I think the game just assumes you're going to be hitting that on turn one and then just clubbing people the rest of the time, which is not bad, but it's it's like, it's not even as good as Mark, because with Mark, you can have someone else set that up. She has to set herself up. She has to hit that and then hit someone the next turn to actually get the full use out of it. So you're kind of paying, as I, I've said before, you're paying that tax. So if you want to use a damage vessel, you're always using Hand of Light turn one to set yourself up. And like I said before, most fights that aren't boss fights are over by turn three or four. So you hit this once, you club a couple things on turn two and three, everything's about dead, then you just group heal and that's, that's it. That's usually her rank two fight in a nutshell. But considering you're giving yourself 25 extra damage at the seven to 14 range doesn't feel great. So as I keep saying, I don't like her as a damage spec. It's there, it's just not good, I feel like. And so, what kind of blocks her out from potential S tier dominance, even though she's a great healer, is the fact that her other build type is just not good. And even if you spec for it and drop in the right trinkets and stuff like that, it's just not as good as a bounty hunter or a highwayman in that regard. And you're really just trading some of your potential damage for the fact that you can group heal, which is still good. But as I said, I'd rather just have her as a dedicated healer and then have someone else up front that can do more damage than that. Her camp skills are pretty niche. They really rely on a religious party. Sanctuary is pretty bad if you don't have anyone else that can prevent ambush. Unless someone has a mortality debuff, then it's okay. But otherwise, you want to use something else. As I said before, the other anti-ambush skills are a lot better. Pray and Chant just fall under the same category. They're pretty bad if you don't use them on a religious party. So you usually want two other people or whatever that have access to it before you use it. Bless is good. It's that mixture of offense and defense that's really helpful. So usually if you're going to use any of her skills, I would say bless first. Try and use someone else for ambush. And then the other two only use them if you really need to. Her vanilla trinkets are pretty bad. The virtuous chalice is whatever. The haste chalice is also whatever. I'd rather almost have a quick draw in most cases. The youth chalice is okay. Gives her a little tankiness at the sacrifice of some damage that she doesn't really care about. Profane Scroll, definitely really good if you're gonna go rank two. It's almost, again, it's that tax that we keep talking about. So if you're on a rank two Vestal, it's probably better than her Crimson Court set for that spot. But I can definitely see like the Profane Scroll and one of the Crimson Court trinkets, the Atonement Beads could probably be okay. The Tome of Holy Healing, I would rather get like that green charm that gives plus 10 or 15 or whatever to healing skills and not take the minus 15%. That's actually pretty substantial. And then there's Sacred Scroll, which is okay. I used to use it all the time, but as I've gotten better at the game and also the Crimson Court set that came out, this trinket just felt worse and worse as time went on, especially the minus stun chance and the minus damage. As I was saying before, her stun's actually okay, and the damage from Judgment is nothing to scoff at, so nuking that in favor of just going straight healer, because that's all you're resigning her to when you use a Sacred Scroll, is just, I'm going to hit Divine Grace or Divine Comfort every single turn, and that is all this character is doing. If that's all you're doing, then yes, use a Sacred Scroll, but... I think that the supplemental damage she can throw out or the random stun makes Sacred Scroll worth skipping unless you want to use the, I think the minus dodge one, Illumination or whatever. But otherwise her trinkets are pretty meh and I'd rather use some of the neutral ones or other support ones like the Ancestors map, very good on her. The reason I don't like the Crimson Court set together is because it forces you into a rank two Vestal and there's already an item that does that. The Profane Scroll puts her in rank two. So they gave her a trinket set that did the same thing but you need two instead of one, which is not, not okay, not fun. It's thematic, 
the minus virtue chance on atonement beads, that, that is definitely tied to the personal lore. You don't feel virtuous when you have to atone for things, right? So that's pretty cool. But this whole thing forces you into a specific build. You're gonna have to be rank two, divine comfort, probably maze bash, one of the debuff skills, and then the stun skill. Like that, that is your four. And as we were saying before, I would rather use the profane scroll in that situation and just put something else on in place of having to use both sets, or both for, to make the set. The heretical passage is, I would say bad. It costs a lot, and again, it's that weird split of you have something that boosts her healing, but then you also have something that boosts her damage, but all of it's conditional. It's all conditional damage, it's all conditional healing, and it's plus stress on top of it, and it costs 70 shards. This is actually, I'm sure there's always one person out there It's like, we'll shuffle, I used it, and I got to wave 500 with that Vestal. It's like, good for you. Doesn't mean that it's not garbage on average. I would rather use the Salacious Diary. I actually, by itself, the Salacious Diary is okay, just for the flat 25% skill, or healing skill boost. I would rather use that and not have the condition for healing. I don't care about damage to Husk and Eldritch, she's not there for damage. And then also you get the 10 stress on top, what the hell is that? So at some point I'm gonna do some class guides and when I do the Vestal, usually I run the Salacious Diary and then like one support thing if she's gonna be a healer. So it'd be like Salacious Diary and Ancestor's Map or Salacious Diary and the Survival Guide, Salacious Diary, and if I really want to, the the healing head, Junia's head, or whatever, just get fat bonus healing. But either way, her trinkets are just not that good. The Vestal is largely carried to the A tier just for the sheer healing output that she has, and the fact that Judgment and Stun, I feel that whole loadout is her best one, and those are still reliable. Judgment does okay damage, the self-heal works if you zap a corpse, so if there's just anything, if you want to reliably hit something, you can just Judgment the Corpse. And she has a stun or debuff that she can use from rank 3, so she has some support going on, but as I was saying, her loss of points come from her melee build not being good, and her trinket choice being pretty bad, and the fact that she's forced into one specific role. But otherwise, I love the Vestal. Actually, I love all the classes. I keep saying I love each one, but I use the Vestal a lot. She's very reliable, and I think that alone puts her near the top. Alright, we're at the top three. And the next character I wanted to put in the S tier so bad. Like, this character was there for the first three editions or drafts or whatever of this list, and then finally I talked myself out of moving them down, so... Our last person in the A tier is the Grave Robber. I love this class, she's very fun. She has a lot going for her, but there are a few things that kept her out of the heavens, the upper echelon. And it largely comes down to the fact that she has backline damage. So if you look at her stats, base 36 HP, pretty low, that's right above the Occultist. Base 30 dodge is okay, not amazing. Highest base speed in the game, that does count for something. Really high base crit at 10. But then as we were saying, the 7 to 14 damage, that is that is Arbalest damage, which is also why the Arbalest is way down there, considering that she's supposed to be a sniper. Like, the Arbalest should have had 8 to 15 or something. I mean, they could have bumped that a little bit for her, but I get it. The reason the Grave Robber is rated so highly is really her skill set is very independent. She's very self-dependent. She doesn't really care what the group's doing. She can just adjust between Lunge and Shadow Fade. She can always get to wherever she wants to on the battlefield. Her movement is two forward or two backwards, so she can literally be anywhere she wants at any time. Does not care what happens to the party. She can use these movement skills to help fix the party if something goes wrong, like someone gets slapped into a position they don't want to be in, she can lunge or shadow fade and fix it. She has a mixture of her own damage tools, but also defensive tools, as well as supportive tools in terms of helping other people achieve their objectives, like the dagger move that lowers bleed resist. Her trinkets are really good, and she brings a 250 gold item that you almost always need to each expedition. The pick to the face, one of the few moves that can actually pierce armor, so it naturally has its own minus on damage, which is fair. I think outside of the Shield Breaker, I can't recall another move that can pierce armor, so this makes it really good. And then Lunge is just incredible, does bonus damage to Blight, has its own plus 40%, has higher than average accuracy at 95, has a fat crit modifier, really good move to finish enemies off with, very common to just have your Grave Robber on like turn three, just lunge into that, that target in like rank three or two that's at half HP, just crit him for 30 and that's it. And then it has a natural affinity with Shadow Fade, so she can just lunge forward and then Shadow Fade back, be perfectly safe. And the best part is, you don't even have to spec for lunge, you don't have to give her a melee build, she doesn't need Slugger and the Letter Opener to make lunge good, it's just good with the range build. It's just a good finisher, or a good thing to move around the battlefield with. Flashing Dagger's probably your weakest move, 
surprisingly. It does okay damage, and it lowers bleed resist, which helps your, your Hellions, your Highwaymen, your Jester specifically. It hits the same ranks, so it's pretty good there, but there are a lot of other things that lower bleed resist now, like the Flagellants and the Highwayman, which makes Flashing Daggers not as appealing, and in most cases, your Grave Robber likes to be set up. She doesn't like to set people up, so you'd rather be using Throwing Daggers or Poison Darts, and then finishing people off with Lunge. You don't want to be hitting Flashing Daggers two or three turns in a row while your Jester's sitting there spamming Harvest or whatever. As we said with Lunge, Shadow Fade is just naturally synergistic, very amazing defensive tool because it gives her stealth, and she gets a fat damage bonus on top of it, and then also a dodge bonus when she comes out of stealth. It's a, it's so good. It's such a good move. You can do so much just by lunging and shadow fading each turn, to the point where it's actually not a bad strategy to have your party start with the Grave Robber in rank 2. Just because her high base speed, you can give her like another plus 2 speed from something else, or if she has On Guard, or whatever. And then turn 1, you just Shadow Fade, and then you put the party into the position that you normally want, and then she can just come out of Stealth throwing Daggers for fat bonus damage. But otherwise, I think Shadow Fade might be her... It might be her best move. It's one of them. Probably her top 3, in her top 3 moves. It's a really good one. The Throne Dagger. Really good move, something she snipes with, it has its own innate damage penalty which kind of sucks, so you're kind of banking on an early crit, since she has her, you know, base 10 speed, it's really nice to turn one, throw a dagger at that cultist in the back, or the pink fish or whatever, and then just hit that crit for 20 damage, take him down, and then give yourself bonus accuracy and just start sniping everyone. The bonus mark damage is natural, it's kind of hard to set her up though, because you need someone else to go before her, ideally, and that's not happening with her 10 speed, so usually she's doing something else turn 1. Honestly, what you could do, turn 1, Shadow Fade, and then have someone mark for her, and then turn 2 just comes out throwing daggers for fat damage. But in most cases, you can just leave her in the back and act as a pseudo-sniper, just hitting throw dagger every single turn. Poison Dart, pretty handy if you have other Blighters. Because of all of her bonus damage to Blight targets, she's really synergistic with the Shield Breaker, as well as the Plague Doctor, and to a lesser extent, the Abomination. Just anyone that can do Mass Blight, she appreciates, so she can just get all that bonus damage with Lunge and Throw Dagger. Or she can help them out also by lowering their Blight Resist with her Poison Darts. It also hits every rank, which makes it really good. So you can sit there and like throw daggers to pick off the people in the back, and then if you don't want to use the pick and put her up front against those bruisers, she can just wear them down with uh, Blight Damage. And also goes for four rounds instead of three, which is worth noting. And then her last one, the Toxin Trickery, is... Pretty good, it's defensive, gives her a bonus speed, or gives her some bonus speed, bonus dodge, cures Blight and Bleed, so it's a reactive tool, and it's still solid, but I don't like using it for the cure Blight and Bleed, even though that is helpful, because she doesn't have the defensive hit points to be reactive. You know, she's gonna get hit for whatever damage, and then take a three or four point bleed, slash blight, and so she'll lose like anywhere between eight to maybe 15 hit points, and then she'll hit this, and then she'll be defensive, but you're better served by her dodging it in the first place than reacting to it. So even though this isn't a bad move by any means, I don't think it's her best one. In fact, I might say it's one of her worst, but that's just how good this character is. Even her potentially worst move is still good in a lot of situations. Her camp skills overall are really good. The snuff box is fantastic. That's potentially two diseases removed for three points. You know, high level, depending on your building upgrades. If you cure two people that are diseased, her and someone else, that's just 1600 gold about you gave yourself. And snuff box could have easily been four points and I would still be okay with it. At three, it's just, it's really good. Gallows Humor, really good if it works, if you don't hit the 10 stress, which the odds are in your favor, but still pretty solid. Four points, a little steep, but it has the potential to high roll and be really good. Two points for bonus 20 scouting, fantastic, sign me up. And then one point to get a supply item, sometimes good. Sometimes you get something you need, sometimes you get something that just becomes gold at the end, but it's never bad, it's only one point. So if you find yourself in those odd situations, like why not, let me just see if I can get a key or another holy water or something. Her trinkets, especially her vanilla ones, I would argue they're in the running for the best in the game. They're just so good from top to bottom. Her common ones, bonus two speed, fantastic. She's going first in just about every fight outside of some weird enemy high rolling her or something like that. The sickening satchel, fantastic. Again, more synergy with blighted targets. Blighting satchel, if she wants to blight them for you, 
really good. Even by itself, the one speed for four dodge, pretty solid. Lucky Talisman, probably your best trinket. I think it got nerfed. I don't think it used to have the plus stress. I think they put that on later. I could be wrong. But either way, 10 accuracy, great. She'll almost never miss because she has high base accuracy. 12 dodge, incredible. Puts her up to 42 base dodge. Thank you. Hell yeah, I'll do that. Rare charm, or trinket rather. I can find that early. You can start finding that, doing those long missions or something like that. Really good. And then Raider's Talisman, they actually nerfed it harder. It used to, I think, be plus extra food consumed, which no one cared about. So instead of taking four food, she'd all, she'd have like automatic tapeworms, so you'd have to take five on a hunger check. And then they changed that to minus 10% HP, which is a little more scary. But either way, five crit, unconditional, two speed, unconditional, 15 scouting chance. She's already got a camping skill that puts her up another 20, so you could have bonus six, you could have 60% scouting chance from her alone after you camp. It's fantastic. The Trap Disarm is probably the worst stat on here because you don't need it because she's already a rogue, so her disarm chance is pretty good, but never fail a trap. I'm down. And my most common Grave Robber loadout is the Lucky Talisman and the Raider Talisman. They just work so well together, and they cover so many bases, and for having that combination, you get 10 stress, no one cares, minus 10% HP, kind of bad, but she's so defensive with the ability to go stealth and stuff like that, and her innately high dodge now. Her Crimson Quartz set is okay. The whole thing combined is really good. You only lose 10% HP for a ton of buffs, but I don't think her Blight build with the Absinthe is that strong. I think her Throwing Dagger or Lunge or just Super Movement builds, even using the Pickaxe, I think all those are better than spamming Poison Darts, even though I find myself doing that from time to time just because it's nice and easy. I will say though, the Sharpened Letter Opener, if you're going melee, you don't even need the set, just put that on. Five dodge, extra damage, that almost makes it worth using lunge and pickaxe exclusively just having her maybe in rank three i think she can use pickaxe there so you can just use that until you want to lunge and then shadow fade over and over so definitely if you like your grave robbers to be melee just use sharpen letter opener you almost don't need anything else the top shelf tonic is actually pretty good it's expensive at 80 shards but 15 dodge conditional but still 15 dodge three speed pretty good on his face 50 percent blight duration that means that your poison darts last for six turns instead of four, which gets way better if you fight any enemy that has multiple actions. So those rare enemies that have like three turns, but usually two, you can just keep hitting poison darts and just stack up that damage. So effectively, each time you use poison darts, this trinket's adding, I think, eight damage at max rank. It's just damage over time, but still that's... Would you take a trinket that gave you bonus eight damage? Yeah, maybe. That's still pretty good, right? Not percent, just like flat plus eight. So top shelf, definitely good if you want to go the blight route. So hopefully in that span of however many minutes that Grave Robber review was, you can see why I almost put her S tier. She just has a lot going for her, and I should fix my previous statement. I think her worst move is still Flashing Daggers, the minus bleed one, not the cure blight thing or whatever. But she has some really good defensive tools. She has fantastic trinkets. She has high damage output. She's good at cleaning up. She synergizes with various playstyles. She's good if someone sets her up with mark or blights and all that. She's good as a solo damage character by hitting throwing dagger and lunging. And on the off chance you want to boost your bleed teammate, she has a move for that too. And then just the fact that she can stealth and buff herself and give her a bunch of damage and all that is just really good. Very solid character. As I said before, the only thing really stopping her from S tier is 7 to 14. If her damage was 8 to 16, it'd be it would be up there. And it's interesting, at least in my own criteria, how close she was to it. And her low HP is worth mentioning because as good as her base defenses are and stuff like that with dodge and shadow fade, there will be a time where she just gets clipped in the middle of her combo. Like she'll lunge up and then she doesn't get to shadow fade next turn. She gets hit for 20 and bleeds or something like that. Or she eats a stun if you're in the warrens, that kind of stuff. So I think that is worth mentioning. The fact that she can go down in like two hits if the enemy catches her in the wrong spot. But I will also say I think she's, she's kind of tough, I would think, to... But she definitely isn't the easiest character either to just drop in and use immediately. You could just go Throwing Dagger, but to get the most out of her, you do have to have a party that can respect her constant moving if you go that route. And that can also protect her in case something goes wrong and she gets caught up in the front or something like that. Alright y'all, that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you're thinking. All that stuff. The next one should be coming a little sooner. Um, it is... Only two characters that are at the top, which you can already tell what they're going to be. So hopefully you're interested in the reasoning behind it, not just who's actually up there. 
And as I said, it should be a lot faster to edit that one. The reason being, this one took maybe 40 or 50 hours to finish. It was a uh, it was definitely an ordeal because I switched up the editing style midway through. As I said, that's the end of this one, and I feel like the Grave Robber might be kind of a controversial pick. We'll see. I expect some... something coming back on that one, but yeah. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you're thinking. All that other YouTube crap. Bring your lovely self to the Discord, because that's always cool, and that makes you somehow cooler with magical cool points that don't exist. And hopefully the next one's by the end of the week. And regardless, I have enjoyed your company and your viewership, so thank you. And I'll see you later.